Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Berean Bible Church this morning. This morning, um, we're going to be looking at what Paul has to say to the Corinthian believers about the second coming of Christ. Now, whenever you talk about the second coming of Christ, we know this is a controversial subject in the church today because most of the church, the church by far, is looking forward to a future coming of Christ that will literally end the world as we know it. In a recent interview, former, former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman predicted, <laughs> predicted that President Barack Obama's handling of the Middle East was a sign of the end times that Jesus Christ would soon return to earth. She said this last week, if we actually turn our back on Israel, as we have seen Barack Obama do today, if that happens, then I think we will see a scale and a level of pushback in the United States. Negative consequences. I don't know what they are. And here's the thing, people, this, this idea that Israel is right no matter what they do, and we just got to stand behind them. And that's a, a misunderstanding of the Bible. She goes on to say, but I believe that the Bible is true. I agree with you there, Michelle and believe that the Bible says is that our nation and the people of our nation will reap a whirlwind. And we could see economic disasters, natural disasters. So she says, you know, because we're not supporting Israel, it could get really bad, people. She goes on to say, we need to be on, a, on fire right now about the things of Christ and the things of God. That needs to occupy our time and our thoughts virtually from morning to night. I agree 100% with her there, okay? But then she goes on to say this, because, here's why we need to do this, because we have very little time. In my opinion, left before the second return of Christ, that's the good news. So she says, we just have a little time left. Now, how long have people been saying that? Just a little time. Thousands of years. Now, for 2,000 years, people say we have a little time. I don't know about your book, but my book, 2,000 Years, is not little by any stretch of the imagination, all right? I, I like how she ends this. She goes, that's good news. Let me ask you something, people. Is the return of Christ in judgment really good news? <laughs> not to Israel, that's for sure. The prophet Amos kind of disagrees with Bachman, so you pick which one you want to side with. But Amos says this, Alas, you who are longing for the day of Yahweh, this is the second coming of Christ. They're longing for it. For what purpose will that day of Yahweh be to you? It will be darkness and not light. As when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him. Or goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of Yahweh be darkness instead of light? Even gloom with no brightness in it? The day of Yahweh was going to be a time of judgment, as John said, especially for Israel. Now, Amos is the earliest of the prophets to introduce this Moffat of the day of Yahweh. His criticism shows that Israel expected the day of Yahweh to be a time of vindication over their enemies and all good things, and Amos warns them, listen, it is a time of disaster. So this view expressed by Bachman is the dominant position on the second coming by the church today. And here's the problem, people. We've got politicians holding this view. They're making policy, foreign policy for the United States based on a misunderstanding of Scripture. That's not good. As we look at what Paul taught the Corinthians over 2,000 years ago, hopefully it'll help us better understand when Christ is to return. Now, I'm just going to look at the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, just to see what they say about the second coming of Christ. You could do this with any book of the Bible. They all talk about the coming of Christ, and they all say the same thing about it. But it seems like today, in our day, people have missed this for some reason. The church in Corinth was begun by Paul on his second missionary journey. He stayed in Corinth for at least a year and a half, preaching and teaching the gospel. Many of the Corinthians came to Christ, and they founded a church. 
Well, about three or four years after that, Paul left Corinth. He wrote the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians to the church. If you were going to write a letter to the Corinthians and you knew the Corinthians, what would you say? How would you begin that letter? Would you begin to address this group? If, if you really understood how messed up they were, would you question their salvation? You know, many people today who hold a lordship salvation position would surely say these Corinthians, they're not even Christian. I mean, they're so messed up. I mean, everything you could do wrong, they're doing it wrong. If you did believe they were Christians in spite of their sin, how would you deal with it? What would you say to them? Look what Paul, he says here in, in chapter 5, he says, it's actually reported that there's immorality among you, immorality of such a kind as does not exist among the Gentiles. The people that don't know God aren't as messed up as you are in this area. That someone has his father's wife having sex with his mother-in-law, okay? Listen, the Corinthians were being divisive. They were living in immorality. They were suing one another. They're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, just to name a few of their sins. With all of their sin, some, more, some much worse than others, Paul begins his letter by reminding the Christian, Corinthians of their secure position in Christ. You won't hear preachers do this, but this is, this is the biblical pattern. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. Paul, called an apostle of Yeshua the Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Yeshua, set apart, sanctified in Christ Yeshua, then he says this, saints by calling. You know, Paul doesn't start out by calling them spiritual scumbags. You guys are a mess. You need to get your act together. He says, hey, I'm, call, I'm, I'm directing this to the set-apart ones in Christ. To those who are saints by calling. The word calling here is kletos, and it means appointed to. To those who are saints by appointment. We could translate this, called to belong to Yeshua the Christ. That's pretty amazing. You know, Paul knew these people very well. We see that throughout the letter. But this is how he starts. And I think pastors should take note of this, okay? Here's the, he doesn't question their salvation. Nowhere in the epistles does he question their salvation. He does tell them to straighten up their act. But this is where you start, people. Here's why you straighten up your act. You belong to Christ. You are set apart in him. You have been called to be a saint. Paul, when preaching in Corinth, Obviously, preach the judgment of God, the return of Christ, and our accountability to Him. The Corinthians knew all about the second coming of Christ, and they were really eagerly waiting His return. Look what he says in 1.7. So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Yeshua the Christ. Now, the revelation of our Lord Yeshua the Christ is talking about the second coming. Notice their attitude toward the second coming. They are awaiting eagerly. Now, this attitude implies that they believe the second coming is near. People, this is written 2,000 years ago. These people he's writing to are awaiting. These are first century saints in Corinth. We've got to keep the principle of audience relevance in mind as we read. This book didn't arrive in the mail for us today. All right? It was written 2,000 years ago. The Christians who lived in Corinth in the first century. What it meant, it meant first and foremost to them. And until you understand what it meant to them, you have no clue what it means to you. We need to test everything we believe by the text in context. The beliefs that you hold have to come out of the Bible, not be read into the Bible. And we must be open to allowing the text to shatter our false ideas. Whatever it says, let's just buy it. Let's follow it. Because it's the Word of God. Not our own opinions, not our own traditions. The words awaiting eagerly are from the Greek word epidekomai. This Greek word is made up of three words put together. The word to receive, which means 
It, it speaks of a welcoming or appropriating reception such as is given a friend who comes to visit. You're, you're longing for this friend to come, and they come, and you're just excited that they're there. It's made up of the word off, speaking here of the withdrawal of one's attention from other objects. In other words, you're, you're not focusing on anything, anything else because you're excited about this visitor that's coming. And the word out that's used here in a perfective sense, which intensifies the already existing meaning of the word. The composite word speaks of an attitude of intense yearning and eager waiting for the coming of the Lord. I think it's obvious that Paul taught the Corinthians that the second coming of Christ would take place in their lifetime. Now, if it wasn't to be for a couple thousand years, they're pretty foolish sitting around anxiously waiting for something to come, all right? Because it, it wouldn't matter to them, all right, if it was thousands of years in the future. Now, this Greek word, apodecomai, is only used eight times in the New Testament, and seven of them are in reference to the second coming. Three of the eight of apodecomai are used in Romans 8. Let's look at those. In 8.19, he says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly, apodecomai, for the revealing of the sons of God. And he says in 23, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, Waiting eagerly, epic decamai, for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. And in verse 25 it says, But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly, epic decamai, for it. Now, this passage is often used, verse 19, against preterism. Our opponents say that creation is still in bondage, it is decaying. Therefore, preterism is wrong. But let me ask you a question. Can the physical creation wait eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed? Are the rocks and sticks and bugs and mountains, the, is the world somehow, the dirt, waiting for this? No, of course not. Paul's not talking about physical creation in this verse. He's talking about Israel. Israel is the creation. The Greek word used here for creation is katesis, which is at times used for physical creation, but it's also used for mankind. Look at Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all katesis. Now, are they supposed to preach to rocks and sticks and trees? And No. This obviously doesn't mean physical creation here. They're to preach to people. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new Katisi. Again, uh, definitely talking about men. Believers are made a new creation. They're turned into the body of Christ. We're no longer in the body of Adam. We are new in Christ. Galatians 6.15 For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new katesis. And then he says in Colossians 1.15 And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all katesis. So the word katesis does not always mean physical creation. It is used for men. And I think that's how it's used here in Romans. In Isaiah 43, we see that Israel was God's creation. But now thus says Yahweh, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. So he is the creator. He's the one who formed Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. He's talking here about the creation of the covenant people of God. And we know that that's what God did. After he turned all the nations over to the watchers, he turned to Abraham and he called himself a new people. You guys, are, all you guys are under the watchers now. The watchers have different groups of people in different geographical areas. I'm starting over because nothing worked with you guys. I'm going to call a new people. And he calls Abraham and he calls Israel. And that didn't work out too well either, okay? <clears throat> In 8.23, it says, not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for adoption, the redemption of the body. So they're waiting eagerly for adoption as sons, which he also calls the redemption of the body. And we'll talk about this more when we get to 2 Corinthians, but this is tied to the second coming. That's what they're looking for. This adoption happens at the second coming. This redemption of the body happens at the second coming. All right, let's move on, Corinthians, verse 8. 
who shall also confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Yeshua the Christ. Now, the end here is the day of the Lord. And it does not refer to the end of time, but the end of the Jewish age. Notice our Lord's words in Matthew 24, 3. He was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now notice they connected his coming with the end of the age. Now, he says these things here. That refers to the temple's destruction in verse 2. In verse 1, the disciples point out the temple building. In verse 2, Yeshua says all these things will be destroyed. And it should be clear, they're asking when. When will the temple be destroyed? They considered his coming and the end of the age to be identical events with the destruction of the temple. They connected all those things. And the temple was destroyed in AD 70, so that gives us a little clue on timelines here. So the end is the end of the old covenant. Well, you know, we read end and we just think end of everything, end of the planet, end of, you know. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment on rebellious Israel. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart, then each man's praise will come from him. So Paul tells the first century Corinthian believers to wait until the Lord comes. Doesn't that imply he's coming in their lifetime? Or is he just trying to deceive them? Hang on. It's a couple thousand years away, but just hang on. I had a, a couple of lawyers once tell me, husband and wife team, that they thought that he said this to every generation because he wanted every generation to be ready for his coming. So I said, really, he's lying to them, though, right? He's lying to every generation except the one that he comes to. And they had no problem with that. It's okay for the Lord to deceive all these generations, telling the falsehood, because they're not. Wait until the Lord comes. How can you wait for thousands of years? The Corinthians can't wait. No one can wait for thousands of years, people. It just doesn't fit. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, our, Paul and the first century Christians there, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So the end of the age came upon the first century saints, not the end of the world, the end of the old covenant. Now, let's look at chapter 15, which deals with the resurrection. About 18 years ago, I was teaching verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. I was in chapter 14. I had a paradigm shift. I came to realize that the second coming was a past event, not a future event. So I stopped. I couldn't go into 15. I mean, I had no clue what I believed. I knew it taught on the resurrection, but I had no clue what the resurrection was. So I said, I got to stop. I got to take a break here. And everyone's, why, 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 why? And when I told them, we got it. We got the right foot of fellowship. <laughs> I got booted out. Uh, <laughs> I believe what everybody else believed. I thought the resurrection was corpses coming out of the ground. Now I understand the resurrection is a spiritual transformation from death to life. We don't have time to deal with all that this chapter is about. Alan's going to be teaching on this chapter at the conference, so hopefully you'll get some good insight into chapter 15 there. But my intention is just to simply show you that the Corinthians expected Christ to return in their lifetime. Look at 51 through 53 of chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Who's the we here? And it's Paul and his audience, first century Christians. They're the ones that are going to be changed. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality. All right, at the last trumpet, the dead are going to be raised and the living are going to be changed. All right? Who are the we in this text? Well, again, it's, it's not us, Okay? Paul and the first century Christians. This is not referring to us. Paul looked for these events in his lifetime. We shall not all die. We shall be changed. If you compare Scripture with Scripture, which is always a great idea, instead of comparing Scripture with commentary, compare Scripture with Scripture. 
That's the divine commentary, all right? You'll see that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and Matthew 24, 31 are parallel texts. They're all talking about the same event. Look at Matthew 24, 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather the elect from the four corners of the winds, one end of the sky to the other. So we see here the trumpet and the elect gathered, just like we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 there, the trumpet, the dead are raised, the elect are being gathered. This is a reference to those dead in Christ. The dead in Christ are raised into the presence of God, and the living people are changed. So the living people, nothing happened to them that you could see. All right? They were changed, but they put on immortality. Now they have eternal life. Up to that point, eternal life was a hope, it was not a half. This is a spiritual gathering that he's talking about. The dead being raised imperishable. They're being gathered into the presence of Yahweh. This is the resurrection. It's the same idea found in Matthew 24, 31. The trumpet sounds, the elect are gathered, they're resurrected. Now Daniel connects the resurrection with the destruction of Jerusalem, which is, you know, very important. And uh, I know I shared with you before, I asked R.C. Sproul Sr., I said, what keeps you from being a full preterist? And he said, the resurrection. The resurrection. And I said, what do you do with Daniel 12? And he said, next, did you have something that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> I'm like, I'm done talking now? Or he was done talking anyway, you know. Because, I, I, I mean, Daniel 12 is talking about the resurrection. Now, at that time, Michael the great prince who stands guard over, the sun, over your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation. What's that talking about? That's the great tribulation. All right? There's a time of distress to what nation? Daniel's nation, Israel. At that time, your people, whose people? Daniel's people, Israel, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to everlasting contempt. All right, so we, we got a time of great tribulation that has never been before for a nation, for Daniel's people, for Israel, and then there's going to be a resurrection. And just in case we miss it, he further clarifies it as a time of Jerusalem's destruction in verse 7 of that chapter. And I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. And as he raised his right hand, his left hand toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a times, times, and a half a time. How long is that? Three and a half years. How long was the tribulation? Three and a half years. That was the siege on Jerusalem. Three and a half years. All right, so we got times, times, and a half times. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Well, Daniel says the resurrection will take place when they shatter the holy people. What's that? Is that the church getting shattered sometime? No. This is the Jews. This is Israel. They were completely shattered in AD 70. The temple was destroyed. The sacrifices ceased and have never been done since. It was over. It was finished. It was complete. So I don't understand, you know, people talking about the resurrection, something in the future. Not, not to Daniel. Paul taught it, would take, it was to take place soon. Look what he says in Acts 24. Having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection, both of the righteous and the wicked. Now, Paul uses the Greek word mellow here. There is about to be a resurrection. About to be who? To the people he's talking to in his day, in his time. He expected the resurrection and the coming of Christ in his lifetime. And this is consistent with what you find everywhere in the New Testament. The coming of Christ is always soon. It is never spoken of as far into the future. It's always near, always at hand, always in their generation. John R. Bray came to see this, but he believed there would still be a third coming. And when questioned about it, he goes, well, it's not in the Bible, but I just believe it will happen. I said, well, you can believe anything you want. You can believe in aliens, little green men. You know, it's not in the Bible. You can make up. But then later, Bray said, you know, this is really dumb. It all happened in eighty seven. And he gave up that, hanging on to that, you know, something in our future that has to happen. Well, people want to just hang on to that. No, it's, 
It was for their generation. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Maranatha. Maranatha means the Lord is coming. The Lord's coming. This is Paul's watchword. And its force lies in the certainty and the nearness of his coming. 2,000 years they're yelling out, Maranatha, <laughs> someday he's coming. No, he's coming to them. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians and uh, verses in there that deal with the second coming. Verses uh, 21 and 22 of chapter 1. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us as God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Now this talks about, you say, where's the second coming there? Well, he sealed them and he gave them a pledge. In the first century, the Spirit was given as a pledge of what? Of the promised redemption that would come in AD 70. The redemption was not completed at the cross. Some believers, some preterists believe that, and I think they're very wrong. All right, there was a 40-year transition period of change that was taking place until the redemption was complete. But he gave them a pledge. He gave them the Holy Spirit as a pledge, literally as an, an engagement ring. You know, I'm giving you this down payment, and I'm going to come back and fulfill this. This is the same thing Paul talks about in Romans 8, the spirit of adoption. He says uh, here, they received a spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That spirit of adoption, again, is this idea we gave him the spirit as a down payment until he is completing the adoption process. In verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. So they're waiting eagerly for their adoption, which was the redemption of the body, which happens at the second coming of Christ. Now, the redemption of the body is talked about, I believe, in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. So let's look at that text. This is the text that David read this morning. We know that our earthly tent, which is our house, you hear this read at funerals all the time. It has nothing to do with the funeral, but it sounds good, right? Which is our house is torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put on, shall not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan. Sounds like a body, doesn't it? Being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Again, we have the Spirit given as a pledge that they would receive their new body and be present with the Lord. Pledge, a down payment, a promise. He goes on in verse 6, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, also, we have as our ambition, whether home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. Now, most people today interpret this text as talking about the change that takes place to our biological body at death. And I think if you just read chapter 5, it's easy to see how you could get that. But if we consider the context, I think we get a different sense here. He says, we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here's what's interesting here. The words we have is a present active indicative, which means they already have a house not made with hands. So there are two houses existing at the same time, the earthly tent and the eternal house not made with hands. During the transition period, the old and new covenants existed together for a period of 40 years. The old was growing old. The new was increasing and filling. You know, can these be two biological bodies? If they are, they have a body now, and they, they got two bodies going on at the same time there. We have a building from God. We had a body already. No, that's not talking, I don't think, about bodies here. He says, for indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed or dwelling from heaven. This house is the earthly tent of verse 1. They were groaning in the house they were in, Longing for a new home from heaven. 
Now, is this a physical body? Well, we could certainly say that we've grown in our biological body, right? Especially the more GMOs, the more processed food you eat, the more you will grow, okay? But is this what Paul's talking about? I don't think so. The word grown here is the same word Paul uses in Romans 8. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. So both texts are dealing with the same subject. And I see Paul in our text in 2 Corinthians 5 as comparing two covenants. The old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant caused groaning. So we look at the context of this chapter. The contrast is between covenants. And that seems clear. Let's back up a little to try to get the context here. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. All right, so he's talking about covenant, not of the letter, that's the old, right? But of the spirit, the spirit is the new. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And he's going back and forth, you know, between the new covenant that has the spirit and the old covenant that's of the letter, one kills, one brings life. For if the ministry of condemnation, you know, I would not, I would be afraid to say that if Paul hadn't, okay? You're going to call the Old Covenant a ministry of... Con God gave that Old Covenant, right? But it was a ministry of condemnation. It condemned the people. They were always under condemnation. Because they never could live up to it. That has glory. Much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. It should be clear that Paul's contrasting the two covenants. The old kills. The old condemns. And therefore, they're groaning. Because they're under that old covenant. For if that which fades away was with glory, speaking of the old, much more that which remains is in glory. Now, I think if you look at this in Young's literal, it's a little clearer. For if that which is being made useless is through glory, much more that which is remaining is in glory. So the old covenant, he says, is being, it's in a present tense, being made useless. It's fading away. It's it's going out of existence because the news coming in. The tent of the old covenant body was being torn down, is what he's saying. And look at chapter 4, verse 10. Always caring about in the body the dying of Yeshua, that the life of Yeshua may be manifest in our body. Now you read that and you think, well, body here, that's obviously my physical body, right? Well, body in both these uses is singular. And if he's talking about people in their bodies, it seems he would use a plural. I don't think he's talking about plural bodies. And our here is not is plural, but body is singular. So Paul's been talking about the covenants, and now he uses the word body to speak of these covenants. He hasn't switched his topic to physical, biological bodies. He's still talking about covenants. In verse four, chapter 4, 16 and 18, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That outer man is decaying. Now again, this would be easy to see how you could apply this to the physical, right? If that happens to our physical bodies. It decays, right? But the inner man is being renewed. Verse 18, while we look not at things which are seen. What was seen? That old covenant was visible. Yes, at a visible temple, visible sacrifice, visible priesthood, everything you could see. But the things which are not seen, what's that? What do you see? In, where's the temple for Christianity? Where's the priesthood? Where, you know, you don't see these things like you did. The, for the things which are seen are temporal. That old covenant was temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says the outer man's decaying. They're, they're, they look not at things that are seen. This again is the old covenant, the temple, the priest, the sacrifice, the feast days. were all temporary. But they were to look for the things not seen, the new covenant, which was eternal. Now from the context of the contrast of the covenants, then you come into chapter 5, where the subject is still the contrast of covenants, not biological bodies. And that's what's so important about context. He's talking about covenants, and he comes to 5. We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul's not talking about a new body here. 
He's talking about covenants. The earthly tent, our house, is a reference to the temple. He says in verse 6, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. The we here is not us. The we is Paul and his first century Jewish audience. Think about this. If the body here is our physical body, then as long as we're in the biological body, the physical body, what are we? We're absent from the Lord. Now, that's kind of not a good place, right? See, to be under the old covenant was to be absent from the Lord. It was set apart. It was behind the veil, and nobody ever got near that thing, except the high priest once a year. But we dwell in His presence today. That's the glory of the new covenant. We're not absent from the Lord. Revelation 21 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. His dwelling place. This is sacred space. And he shall dwell among them. They shall be his people and God himself will be among them. So we are dwelling just like Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve. They brought him into sacred space. He brought him into his temple. They lost that because of sin. Now he's saying in the new covenant, he's bringing man back into the sacred space, into his temple, into worship with him. We live in his presence. Sin has been dealt with and we have full access to the presence of God 24-7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. It, we don't longer see the temple. It's no longer physical. It's a spiritual dwelling place. It's wherever we are. Yahweh is there. He says in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Now, that's a connection to Gentiles being joined with the Jews and are of God's household. He's bringing both groups together. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Yeshua himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. How many buildings do you know that grow? That this building is growing because this is a spiritual building in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. See, that's what happened during that 40-year transition period. The church was growing to become a dwelling place of God. In AD 70, God moved in. The house was complete, and He moved in. And the old was done. Yeshua is the cornerstone here. He is the new spiritual temple. The apostles and prophets laid the foundation. And this building grew in the first century. It's not growing anymore. It's a dwelling place of God. It's still adding people to it. But it's God's holy dwelling place. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9, For we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. So you're absent from the body, that body of Israel, that old covenant body, is to be at home with the Lord. They wanted to get out of that body of Israel, that old covenant thing, so they could be present. The tent of the old covenant has been torn down, completely dismantled in 70 believers today dwell in the presence of God forever. Now, many believers today will say, what's the big deal about eschatology? I mean, why, if, it, if this is controversial, and it is, Talk to anybody about it if you have the courage, okay? If you want to get rid of someone as a friend, talk to them about eschatology. <clears throat> and I'm not sure why it's so the way it is. I guess people just like tradition. They don't want to go against any kind of tradition. So believers today, well, what do we care? Why, is it, why do we have to make a big deal about this? Well, we should care about it. Because it's in the scripture. You know, people say to me, why does it matter? I always say, does truth matter? Well, yeah, truth. Well, then it's truth. It's so it matters. You know, you don't pick and choose what you like out of there. You just teach what's in there. Paul taught the doctrine of the second coming to all the churches. It must have been important that he taught him all this. It must have been important to him. It dominates the New Testament. You're not going anywhere and find someone, you know, where it's not talked about. I want to give you a couple quotes from John Calvin. Now, let me set this up. 
Calvin said this about the doctrine of predestination. But I think it applies to preterism. So where he says predestination, you put in preterism, and I think you'll see that it fits. The Scripture is the school of the Holy Spirit, in which as nothing is omitted that is both necessary and useful. So he's saying the Scripture, God didn't leave out anything you needed. All right, it's all in there. It's useful to know. So, nothing is taught but what is expedient to know. So he didn't leave anything out you needed. He didn't put anything in there that you didn't need. Okay, you got that? Therefore, we must guard against depriving believers of anything disclosed about predestination, or we could say preterism, in the Scripture. Lest we seem either wickedly to defraud them of the blessing of their God, or to accuse and scoff at the Holy Spirit for having published having published what it is in any way profitable to suppress. In other words, man, the Lord messed up putting this stuff in the Bible because it, it bothers people. You know, and we don't want to upset new believers, we don't want to upset any believer, so let's just don't talk about it. Do you understand what you're doing when you say that? Calvin goes on. But for those who are so cautious or fearful that they desire to bury predestination or preterism, in order not to disturb weak souls, uh, we better not talk about it to them. You know, they, they can't handle it. Watch what he says. With what color will they cloak their arrogance when they accuse God indirectly of stupid thoughtlessness? Do you see what Calvin's saying? This is back when these guys didn't pull a lot of punches, okay? They weren't worried about your feelings or, you know, being politically correct. <laughs> They accuse God indirectly of stupid thoughtlessness. God, you put this in the Bible, you should have never done it because people don't like it. He goes on to say, as if he had not foreseen the peril that they feel they have wisely met. Well, we're way smarter than him. Whoever then heaps odium upon the doctrine of predestination or preterism openly reproaches God as if he had unadvisedly let slip something hurtful to the church. Can you say amen to that, people? In other words, he, you know, what Calvin is saying, if it's in the Bible, it should be taught. God didn't put things in there that didn't need to be taught. You know, he's not foolish and said, oh, this is only for older Christians, this is not for new, we've got to be careful who we should. No, it's the truth. If someone cares about the truth, then they want to know what the Bible says. And if they don't care about the truth, don't waste your time talking to them. Because if they don't care, that doesn't matter. Since preterism is taught in the Bible, how can we be afraid of it? How can we shy away from it? I mean, we do believe the Bible is the word of the living God. And if we believe the Bible is God's word, we've got to believe everything it says. Why? Are we so willing to hold the traditions of the church over the Word of God? Why are we so afraid of upsetting people? Paul, Paul spent a lot of time talking about eschatology, and I think therefore so should we. Now I know it's controversial. I know it gets people upset. I know, but so what? Once you find that out, okay, then you're done. We don't need to talk to them anymore. That just Gets them angry, causes their face to distort and get all kinds of, you know, all right, we'll drop it. But you don't know who's going to respond until you try. You know, so often we, in our own mind, we pick out, there'd be a good candidate for salvation. You know, well, let's share the gospel with them. Per the person you think is probably the less likely candidate is the one you really want to share the gospel with because, you know, it's all about God anyway, all right? But the same thing here, people. We need to, we need to take this to the masses. All right, because you've got politicians holding this faulty eschatology, and it is causing damage to this nation. They've got to get to the truth. But if it just stays confined with us and we're not reaching out, again, I know I'm calling for a radical thing to talk to people about this because, like I said, it, you, know, you will lose some friends, you will get relatives upset, you will, you know, whatever. But... And I'm not saying try to force it down people's throat who don't want to hear it, okay? But, you know, you don't know until you try. And once you try, I'd still go back occasionally and question them on some things. 
You know, what, what, do you, what do you think this verse means? Look at this verse. What do you, what's he saying here, you know? Cause them to think about the Scriptures. Because I think, you know, if someone's serious about the Bible, they're serious about it because they believe it's truth and they want to know what's in there. So, all right, you got your marching orders this week. See how many people you can share this with. <laughs> see if I can see you on the news. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to look at your Word. Father, it's not just the Corinthians. We realize that. It's everything written in the Scriptures. The New Testament talks about the nearness, the soonness, the at hand to this generation, to those still living. Lord, it's so clear. We have to work hard to miss it. But we've been trained, Lord, to overlook things like this because we have a false system already set up in place. Lord, I pray that the truth of your word would shatter all preconceptions. And we would just fall on our knees before you, desiring, Lord, to know the truth wherever it leads. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your love for us. Amen.